Hi there, guys. How are you? This is Muhammad Musa from AFK Study Plan. Today is Sunday, and I think you know what's happening every Sunday. We have our weekly newsletter number 16. I'm really happy we reached this number, and I hope we can do more of that. So um, today I was supposed to announce the study group. Like I'm still working over it and doing the final touch. So within this week, you can see the video for the study group. Today, I'm just going to post the newsletter to be consistent in the newsletter. As usual, you can see the, st uh, the tags for a question down here, and you can see the previous newsletter from the left side of the screen, and you can see at the upper right corner, you can click the clip and you can download the PDF file. Feel free to give me your feedback. Feel free to send any question about that. And with that being said, let's just start it. First question from Endo. For a patient with suspected incomplete cusp fracture, so the question is telling you we are suspecting incomplete cusp fracture. Which of the following treatment options would help improve symptoms and confirm the diagnosis? So the question is really compound so you can think he gave me the diagnosis. Now he's not asking me for final treatment. Why? Because he's saying we suspected something. So we need to confirm our diagnosis before jumping to treatment plan. So what we are going to do to confirm that we have incomplete cusp fracture. So, bonded composite transit restoration, amalgam restoration, placement of orthodontic band, fabrication of a crown. So, I will give you now algorithm, how to think about um, cusp fracture, how to diagnose it, how to treat it. So, please pay attention because this concept is not very common, but when you see a question about it, it will be really complicated, okay? So what's a cusp crack or um, cusp fracture? So crack tooth is defined as incomplete fracture of the dentin in a vital posterior teeth or tooth that involves the dentin and occasionally extend into the pulp. Because all fracture doesn't extend to the same amount. So some fracture, you can see fracture only cusp. And then the fracture cusp may be incomplete like the second one or maybe complete like the first one and go beyond CEJ into the root or the second or the fracture may be extending as a vertical line extending beyond CEJ or and this is the first one if the fracture is extending like a split tooth into two halves this is the worst one and there's easy to be diagnosed and lastly is a vertical root fracture which is like you cannot see it that frequently and like it, it can be managed patient will not complain about it but like the first three are really painful and patient can feel them so fractured cusp as we can see in this question and there's the first time so let's discuss how you are going to deal with it so what's the symptoms like you can suspect this patient has cusp tooth fracture the patient will get, tell you i have pain sharp and localized Pain on biting or release. And this is extremely important to this one. Th I pay attention here. This is an extremely important point that may push you to think about this crack tooth syndrome. If the patient is telling you, when I bite, I feel pain. When I release, pain is gone. Or the other way, when I'm biting, no pain. But like when I'm releasing, there is pain. This is very good indication that you might have fractured cusp. Why this happening? Because the tooth is cracked, as you can see in the previous pictures. So what's happening when you bite, you are pushing two parts to be away from each other. So you're leading to a pain. Or the other way, when you are biting, there is nothing. But like when you re release and the tooth is going back and giving you pain. Thermal sensitivity, especially to cold. Why this patient has sensitivity? Because the, every time he uh, bites, the crack is propagating more, exposing dentin. And if this tooth has no root canal treatment, so this tooth will be painful or sensitive to cold. But this is not very important here because like not every patient telling you I have sensitivity to cold, you think, okay, so you have cracked tooth syndrome. Biting on pain on biting or release is that key point here. So what you are going to do? Look was elimination and magnification. You use your dental loop and you do like light inside this one what you're looking for you are looking to fracture line and inspection with a probe trans elimination to get the location and then locate tooth wear meaning like sometimes the tooth has patient the patient has parafunctional activities parafunctional um normal um 
abnormal like mastication forces leading to this occlusal wear and this one may give you a um, hint about this or your patient has a big restriction sometimes you can see patient after root canal treatment and he's coming to you to giving you this criteria and this tooth has a big restriction and then do a crown so the tooth is weak weakened teeth and high fractures so what you are going to do we need to con exclude the other so we need to do cold test by test to cold test why are you doing cold test because you want to know like this is maybe by by test reversible irreversible, irreversible so you need to do the cold test so and this is different because i see like some people say okay he has thermal sensitivity especially to cold and you're doing cold test because we're doing cold test to make sure our pulp is vital and this is especially like we cannot do cold tests of patient the root canal treatment for this tooth but this is important because you need to exclude this one bite test there is something called uh bite loss meaning like this is like i i will post a picture about it it's like a tool where it can make a force over one cusp so you put it inside patient mouse and you ask your patient to close his mouse so if he feel pain so this is the cusp you might think it's a fractured cusp and then you do it like twice in the buckle and twice on the lingual side so you can say okay this is maybe fractured cusp okay so now we suspect this is a fracture tooth syndrome so what we are going to do now after we conclude that this pulp is good we need to exclude periodontal periapical causes galvanic reaction meaning like a patient has amalgam and gold filling um, opposite to each other facial pain exposed dentin post-operative pain we need to exclude everything before we go to say okay this is fracture tooth that's why the diagnosis of this one is really difficult and hard to be managed if you see hopeless prognosis so if you see periapical lesion if you see periodontal loss if you see stuff that you can feel like this is like not to be done so you do extraction of this tooth also if you have deep subgingival fracture so it's irreversible so you cannot deal with this you remember the previous picture like when you have a split of the tooth like how you're gonna fix a vertical split in the crown and root hopeless you cannot do it so how you are going if, if the fracture is not too big and you want to save the tooth okay let's do root canal treatment and then do a crown no because this is aggressive and this is you are going to waste your patient time and money so you need to confirm diagnosis before jumping to the treatment so you are going to do splinting of the tooth with bands meaning i'm going to give this tooth a protection to hold the tooth together when i'm holding the tooth together and let the patient go home eat go live his life for a few days i'm coming back to you okay so pain is gone yes you don't have any sensitivity to cold yes it's amazing doctor okay so now i have a diagnosis so now i can do now i can jump to conclusion and say okay this is a fractured fractured cusp so if the tooth ha had drew not even be from before so you redo the filling and do the cap if the tooth has no reach no root canal treatment from before and it was a big filling so you need to replace the filling do root canal treatment and then do it and you can see the question mark beside the root canal needed because this is depend on the extent of fracture sometimes the fracture extend into the bulb sometimes it's not extending to the bulb but at least now you know this is one this is a tooth with fractured tooth fractured cusp root canal treatment if um apical symptoms if restorable you are going to do root canal treatment root canal treatment unsuccessful if canal system uh, reinfect again fractures are unrestorable so you need to extract the tooth long-term management protect with occlusal coverage motor pulp status motor tooth wear so this is the complete algorithm how you are going to deal with cusp fracture i would like you to pause the video here go back and listen and i will give you a quick recap patient come to you saying i have pain on biting or releasing so you suspect cusp fractured cusp so you are going to use your loop using illumination to check it use your probe and we don't use percussion test because it might be crack and then when you percussion do percussion vertical force over the tooth you crack it more so you cannot see 
this is in agris move i'm not going to do this and then we are going to exclude everything else we are going to do cold test we're going to check the periodontal ligament we're going to check the apical with x-ray we're going to check that is exposed dentin stuff like this if we see the fracture is big extending beyond the cement enamel junction or vertical so unrestorable extract and then we don't jump to conclusion we're going to do splinting with a band rubber band um orthodontic band or sometimes there is doing um composite around the tooth but honestly i didn't bring you the picture because like it's it's weird like he, he's doing composite all around the tooth with no bone, no uh, itch, and letting the patient go home. Like, but man, like this composite is super out of occlusion. So how patient is going to buy it? Like, it, it, I, once I saw the picture, I was like, no, no one would do this. And then you can this patient come back if you're saying it's okay. Now I I feel no pain. So you are going to assess RST or no RST, and then the most important one protect with occlusive coverage to make sure this fracture is contained and everything is good. So here, what we're going to do to confirm diagnosis, placement of orthodontic band. I hope this is clear because I know this concept is not very common, but when you see question about it, feel happy because like this question, not everyone can solve, okay? Second question, same discipline and same concept. A patient presents to the clinic complaining of sharp pain when eating in tooth 3-6. Let's pause here. So patient is saying sharp pain on tooth 3-6. We have like a lot to think about it now. So we need to exclude the stuff to reach diagnosis. Interoral examination reveal a small class two amalgam restriction in tooth. Small class two amalgam restriction. So when you see small class two amalgam restriction, no, it's not a Clark two syndrome. Like this is a small class two, and he's saying small, so he's giving me a hint here. So I will not think about Clark two syndrome, and you are totally correct. And then telling you percussion, palpation, and cold test are within normal limits. And here comes the problem because like when you say sharp pain when eating so you think about palpation you think about percussion maybe this patient has periodontal abscess apical abscess and then get telling you percussion and palpation is normal so how come the patient has sharp pain when eating and to like to confuse you more he's telling you the cold tests are within normal limits so it's not palpable it's not periapical but the patient has pain and this tooth has a cavity, which was restored with class two amalgam, but he's saying it's a small one. So which of the following is most likely diagnosis? And giving you different diagnosis, reversible palpitis, symptomatic irreversible palpitis, asymptomatic irreversible palpitis, symptomatic apical periodontitis, incomplete cause fracture. So before you conclude, and, and this is humble advice from me to you, in the exam, you will see some difficult question. You have no clue about it. Trust yourself because I see people like, no, 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 I will speak like um, reversible palpitis because he has sharp pain when, when eating. Like, okay, he's telling you the cold test is, is within normal limit. So let's go to the basics and see the bulb diagnosis so you can conclude. Normal bulb, clinical diagnostic criteria in which is symptom free and normally responsive to bulb testing. This is what we have here. He's telling you it's normally responsive to pulp testing. And then when you read other stuff like reverse palpitis, symptomatic reverse palpitis, and other, it's totally different. Inflammation and then subjective and objective finding is indicating that inflammation should resolve and the pulp return to normal. Like this is reverse palpitis. Symptomatic irreverse palpitis, when you know there is spontaneous lingering thermal pain, and sometimes referred pain cannot go to normal, so you need to do bulb treatment. And then if asymptomatic reverse palpitis, there is inflamed bulb, incapable of healing, pulp necrosis and previously treated or previously initiated. So all is away from normal pulp. And here's telling you I have normal pulp. So you cannot say I have normal pulp in the question and then pick reverse palpitis because you don't know what to pick. So I would recommend you to read option. And if you see option, you do not know about it. Please exclude the stuff like uh, this is not normal. This is not normal. So this is cannot be, this cannot be. So you can pick this option that you don't know and feel confident to do it because like the other option makes no sense. Because I see people, I do not know this option. I know the other option, which is not fitting with the question, but I don't know this one. I will not pick it. No, you should have a courage and the feeling got like, this is not fitting with the description, so I will not pick it. So the crack tooth, 
Diagnostic of crack tooth syndrome, sometimes it's um, an ending syndrome at the end, is often based on the reporting of history of cold sensitivity and sharp pain on biting hard on fibrous food with an ele elevation of symptoms on release of pressure. And this is the whole story. This is how you can say this is a cracked tooth. Like biting, pain, cold pain. Like this is dragging you to different locations. But like when you say only on biting, the pain is relieved when I'm releasing the bite. So you can think about this one. However, the preserved symptoms may display variation in accordance to depth and orientation of the crack. As we see in the first picture, the crack propagation is different, so it will give you different stuff. The visual detection of crack often aided with the use of sharp explorer, probe ideally with magnification, may help to confirm suspected diagnosis. However, not all cracks are symptomatic. The application of buoyant load testing device to apply a force to a suspected fracture is risky due to the possibility of fracture of the tooth Restoration or the opposing tools and therefore not recommended. So this is how you are going to diagnose the crack tooth syndrome and how you're going to deal with it. In the first question, we speak about this one. So please, when you read question, you do not pick. Okay, I'm going to pick this one because I do not know the other one. Reverse palpitis? No, because he's saying cold is within normal limit. Symptomatic reverse palpitis? Same. Asymptomatic reverse palpitis? You should you give different criteria. Symptomatic abica periodontitis, no, because this is percussion are good. So you cannot pick this one. So it's incomplete cusp fracture. Okay? Okay. Next question from Pharma. Which of the following statement is false? Please get your pencil. False. 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 Okay? Nystatin mainly exert its effect on the cell membrane. Azole and fungal work by increasing membrane permeability. Arrhythmia are a common side effect of nystatin. Amphitercin B may cause nephrotoxicity. Antifungal drugs has a lot of severe and hard side effect. That's why most commonly we give antifungals as a topical. And I, I think you realize that before, like most of the antifungal drug is used as topical one. Even not in the in industry only, like topical, like everything is topical. Why? Because it has severe and aggressive side effect so let's get some side effect of the famous drugs so you can read it please read it and try to memorize it move them a mnemonic in your mind a graph like this like try to get a way to remember this stuff because like because i and this is like i, I used to do this <laughs> when i see a side effect of a drug i'm just picking two or three and that's it but the problem like there is huge intersection between them so you should get um, like a pattern inside your brain, a visual, mnemonic, whatever you are going to do to try to memorize whatever is related to this one. Because like when you are faced with this question and there is arrhythmia, you feel like, oh yeah, heart problem. So it's arrhythmia. So it's good, correct. No, you should know. Mouth irritation, vomiting, slow heart rate, like bradycardia, hives, meaning like eczema, rash, stomach upset. Stomach upset meaning like nausea, vomiting and stuff like this. Muscle pain, some patient has muscle crack and skin irritation. So here, how we can like think about it. So your patient has skin irritation, which lead to rash and their rash might have hives. And this patient it has a bradycardia because he has a stomach upset leading to a vomiting, which sometimes give him muscle pain with mouth irritation. So this is a quick story in my mind. So when I think about my statin, so my patient take the drug. So he, he's call, he called me saying, I have a skin rash. This is skin rash. This is skin rash is very big now, leading to a hives. And by the way, doctor, I have a stomach upset. What do you have? I have nausea and I did vomit yesterday twice. And by the way, I go to my gym and I have some muscle pain and I feel my heart is pumping so slow and I mean, my mouth has some irritation inside my mouth. So this is a story so you can get everything together so you can memorize it because i know this is a lot to be done but try to memorize it because this is important because the question will not give you everything and you are close to your exam so you should try to get a mind map you should try to get some memorization photos mnemonic inside your brain to do it because like when you go to more like when you go to amphitercin b let me give you the here so it's totally different you have nephrotoxicity um hematotoxicity infectious related adverse effect like it's totally different one and you should know and you should know this stuff 
because like toxicity, nephrotoxicity, hematoxicity lead to amphitericin B, but like nystatin leading to problem, heart problem, which is not arrhythmia, it's like bradycardia. So you should try to make it like comparison between them from the same family. So you say like antibiotics, some antibiotics leading to a plastic anemia. So you should you should know this stuff. So um, antifungal. So you should like write it one, two, three, and then this one has this. This one had this and try to make him like a mnemonic inside your brain so you can get it because like no one can remember everything. But at least you should know whatever is really important for you to pass exam, correct? So by the way, let's speak about antifungal. It has two families. One is directly acting on the cell membrane and the other one cell wall. Cell membrane has two subcategories, pollen and azoles. Pollen is where amphitensin, amphitensin B and nystatin uh, belong azoles is azole stuff cell wall is like a fungan uh, my fungan ca caspo fungan so this is a family and this is a family so you see now i'm trying to like, this is sour name how i'm going to memorize it so azole is working in cell membrane fungan is working in cell wall but you should know that some medication ending with azole and is working in totally different mechanisms and treating totally different stuff if you can catch up please write it in the comment so this is how you're going to memorize pharma because it is hard and your exam is soon so you know you should get a way or a system where you can memorize the stuff okay so here let's go to the question again so question saying false one and saying nystatin mainly exerts effect of cell membrane yes azole antifungal work by increasing membrane permeability correct arrhythmia is a common or common side effect of nystatin no we said it's bradycardia amphitericin b may cause nephrotoxicity which is correct so I know it's tricky, I know it's too much, but I'm giving you a key here. Try to like, it's antiviral, antibiotics, antifungal. And you write it down, please write down. So your antibiotics, like, like tetracycline, vancomycin, um, metronazole. Um, and you write it down, write it down. And you then go to antifungal. And try to go like, because I see people tend to, okay, I'm studying antibiotics today. I'm not going to say this stuff. But like when you go with like horizontal studying is a good way to recap. So today, after I study antibiotics, I write a side effect of like, like important side effect of antibiotics. So I will go to antiviral, I will go to antifungal to go with the severe or important side effect. And then I go horizontal to compare between them. And you will have the list of bad, bad drugs. So these bad, bad drugs, when you have these bad, bad drugs, so it has a severe side effect. So when you try to connect the stuff in horizontal pattern, so your brain is like getting more of it, so you can memorize more, okay? Next question from Rock and Anesthesia. Which of the following may explain why an inferior alpha nerve block injection in an adult may fail to provide proper anesthesia? Inferior alpha nerve block is very important topic. You will see question at the exam about it. Like you will see one or two question, either the technique, the location of the needle, which, which is, is what what is the structure the needle will go through it at the time till it work like you give this freezing how long it will need to be effective uh you give this freezing like for how long it will last inside your patient mouth pulp anesthesia soft tissue anesthesia this is a lot to be just discussed and this you should know about it because you will see question about this one and it's super clinically relevant to you as a dentist so you should know this stuff okay Adults have thicker bone, which is like, yeah, but like this is the, the reason why it fail. You can say, okay, about this one, and we we'll speak about like infiltration, but here we speak about nerve block. So you should know how nerve block work. If you know how, it's, how it works, you will never break this one. Adults have more active enzyme to break down the anesthesia, maybe. Injection that is too high or too low. So discard the question. So let's speak about inferior alpha nerve block injection technique. So what we are aiming for and what's the problem with the mandibular anesthesia? The problem, the bone here is too thick. If you're trying to give infiltration like you do in the upper one, it will be very hard for you to make sure the solution did go through this thick cortical bone into cancellous bone and do the effect. So our aim here, as you see this purple line, so this is the needle we are going to insert inside the patient mouth and we are aiming to be superior 
to the location or anatomical structure where the inferior other is going inside the bone. So it's like you are blocking the whole door. Like it's a room and there is a water inside the room and you wanted to cut all the water coming into this room. So I'm going to block it from the door. So this is the same technique here. We're going to use our long needle to touch bone in a specific point where we are sure we are superior to the anatomical structure where the nerve go inside the bone, which is lingla. So this lingla is the anatomical foramen where the nerve is going inside the bone. So you catch the nerve from the beginning. When you catch the nerve from the beginning, it's easy to make sure we have a solution coming inside the bone so we are sure our freezing is working. And that's why it's important for you to know the anatomical structure, and that's why you should know this stuff. The average depth of penetration to the bone is approximately 15 millimeters. So the distance, once you punch soft tissue, at least 15 millimeters. So that's why we never do it with short needle. I don't know how dentists doing it. I, I, I did see it more than once. Dentists doing short needle, using short needle to do it. And like, it gives me heart attack. Heart attack. Although this may vary significantly with the size of the mandible and the age of the patient, as with the adult, bone should be contacted before any solution is deposited. You cannot say, okay, I cannot touch bone, so I will just um, give the solution and pray for God it will go. No, you should touch bone. In general, the more inferior location of the mandibular foramen in its children provide a greater opportunity for successful anesthesia. So let me explain this again because like this is... Very hard to understand, but like if you know the technique, so you can understand it. We are aiming for solution to go inside lingua. So the higher you aim, the more sure you are, okay, I'm inside, I'm above this anatomic structure, so the solution will go down. And that's why you ask your patient after you give him inferior avenue for block to open and close his mouth. That's why you get him to the upright position. That's why we do to do some like massage from inside. We are we, we want the solution to go inside the foramen to freeze the nerve. But the problem was like not a problem. The anatomical structure of the bidu, like this um, foramen is not very high because the mandible is still like small in size. So think about the vertical dimension of the mandible is different from bidu till adult. So if you go low you might reach the inferior of the um, anesthesia because the lingula is down. But like for adult, if you do it low, nothing. Like, because I see some dentists try afraid of going upper because like if you go upper, you might hit the parotid gland. So you go lower, lower, but the minimum in adult, you should go at least seven millimeter above the acusa plane. So I hope you understand the concept here because it's important. And this topic in all in all is very important and it's super clinically relevant. And here I would like to recap the position of the needle. This is visual, you can go with. So what, like the first point you should know, we are going through the buccinator muscle. The needle is going through the buccinator muscle. And then it will end up superior to the inferior alveolar nerve, vessel, insertion of my medial trigoid muscle and the medial mylohyoid nerve and the vessel. It will be anterior to the deep part of parotid gland and medial to the medial surface of the ramus, lateral to the lingual nerve, medial trigoid muscle, and sphenomandibular ligament. These are important information you should know and you should memorize because you will be asked a lot about this technique, the, um, what happened if you touch this part, what happened if you go through this part, what happened if you touch the medial trigoid muscle, like it, it, it will be a lot of questions in this topic, please. This is a very high yield topic, study it in depth. So here, as we said, adult has thicker bone. This is maybe correct for infiltration. Adult have more active enzyme to break down the anesthetic. No, injection is too high, which is good. Injection is too low because here we specifically speak about adult. Injection is too low, so you miss the lingula, so you miss the whole concept about this injection, so it will be useless. Okay, okay. Last question from Pharma. During the aspiration of nerves, excise sedation. If the patient become nauseous, this indicates that the patient is nervous, the patient has not eaten before the appointment, the patient is over sedated, the patient is allergic to nas oxide, 
And again, this is from Pharma, Loca, and Anesthesia intersecting together. I'm trying to get a theme in this one about the cracked tooth and the Pharma and Loca anesthetic. Because these topics, like first one topic about the cracked tooth syndrome, is not very common, but like when you see it, you feel how about yourself. But this topic, you cannot go to exam without knowing about it, okay? So, nasal exercise sedation. So, when you give your patient nasal exercise sedation, there is some stuff you feel like it's okay if your patient have it, and you should tell your patient about it so he's not worried when he, he feel it. He will feel lightheaded. He will feel tingling of the hand and feet, feeling warmth, flushing of the face, relaxed body, arms, and leg, numbness of circumoral region. He will feel numbness here, feeling of euphoria, feeling lightness or heaviness of body. So, it it, this is the criteria you should tell your patient because most commonly it's used for BDO. So you should tell this to the um, child before you start because like if he feel it, he will be panicked. Like think about like if he numbers here, it will be not normal for him. But he, when he knows, it's uh, easy for him to understand it. And you should also tell him whatever when you feel is very hard and this is not correct. So you should tell me. Over sedation, irritation or agitated. Some patient, when you give it to him and you increase the nurse excitement, he will get agitated. Inability to communicate. You're asking him, open your mouth, close your mouth, he cannot do it. Sleeplessness or dreaming. So if your patient is going to sleep, that's why you should speak with him. Hi, hi, are you here? What do you feel? Like you should speak, you should communicate with the patient. How was the nation for sure? Nausea, vomiting, loss of consciousness. If your patient that's taken like go to any of this situation so you, this is over station so you should tell your patient if you feel this stuff please tell me and you should communicate to your patient because the patient cannot tell you i cannot communicate with you so you should tell your patient about it so you know this is over station and when you have over station what you are going to do with an exercise you are going to go to 100 percent oxygen and wait at least three to five minutes because you wanna to prevent hopefully someone will answer this one and then you should stay at this status of 100% nitrous oxide for at least three to five minutes to make sure everything is good for your patient because there is like, I will not say it. I hope someone will catch it here. So this is if your patient noxious, so this patient is overstated and you should stop it, give him oxygen and wait and assure him everything is good and then let the patient go home and do it next time. Okay, that was all for today. Thank you very much for watching till the end. Hopefully you get some benefit from this condensed newsletter. I'm trying now to get a theme in the newsletter. So making like three back to back to question from the same topic or two back to back questions from the same topic. So you can build knowledge about this topic. I'm not here just to waste your time. I'm trying to give you knowledge about important topics that you can say high yield and you might see in, the, in your real exam. Thank you very much for watching that and see you next Sunday.